Kia ora koutou and welcome to Lunch on the Way. We're three guys doing theology over lunch and sometimes we do that with others. But we have to warn you though, what's said here is not yet complete because like any good conversation, you never want it to end. So please join us for Lunch on the Way. As always, I'm joined by Jonathan Hoskins, Graham Flett, and myself, Joey Millington. And today, Jonathan's, Jonathan's taking the lead in this conversation. Right, well, Jonathan? I'll kick it. Oh, yeah, right, Joey. <laughs> yeah. I'm going <laughs> to kick us off anyway. Yeah. I'll kick us off and um, I'll just leave it to you guys because I th- I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll know more about this than I do. So here's, here's the thing. So um, I caught up with a friend of mine who's just finished his master's on Blaise Pascal, who's a philosopher, inventor, mathematician of uh, a couple of hundred years ago. And um, Blaise Pascal has this line that, um, that the practices that we do every day, the things that we get involved in, our practices and our habits, shape who we are and who we become. So that's one of his things. The other part of this is that when he invites people to know God, he says, don't tell them who God is. Don't you know, make up an argument for God. Just invite them to, to, into the Christian way of practicing life. And that will start to work on them and they'll come to know who God is through the practices that Christians do. Does that kind of make sense? Hmm? Yeah. You can, I mean, you talk to this as well, Joey, because I know that you know some, you know, you might be able to frame this up better. So that's one thing. The other thing is that there's a, there's a writer called Annie Dillard who says, you are what you do every day. So there's no way around that. Whatever you do every day, the things you get up and you're involved with, that is who you are. That is what your life will be about, right? So putting those two things together, I, I, I'm wondering if it might be interesting for us to think about what are the practices and the habits that bring us closer to God? What are the habits and practices that we are involved in that maybe take us away from God? And are practices and habits, are there neutral practices and habits that we're just involved in that don't really take us away or lead us towards God at all. So when you shared that story initially, because I did hear it yesterday a little bit, yeah. um, the thought that came to me was how, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's a fun thing to think about. Um, I heard a story of someone who was a Christian, and mm-hmm. they, as an experiment, they wanted to no longer do Christian things and to see if they would remain a Christian for a year. Right. Okay. You know, still hold to that belief system. Yeah. So they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't go to worship. They wouldn't um, read their Bibles. They wouldn't pray or as much as they could help it. Um, and, and you know, just go through the list. And they would just go and live as if they were living a secular life, mm-hmm. um, as, as they think that anyone who is non-religious might live. Yep. And can you imagine what happened before the year ended? Yeah, I think I can guess. <laughs> yeah, they were no longer a Christian. Yeah. And they completely... They, they came to believe that, oh, this is all foolishness anyway. Yeah. So that, when I hear, heard what you just said there, it made me think of, oh, is there, did that person become a non-Christian because they, they got outside the community of faith? Did they become a non-Christian because they no longer did things that actually result in belief, which is action? Or did they become a non-Christian because they actually became, like, came to an intellectual conclusion as to, like, how from their perspective foolish christianity was or is it all kind of playing into it um yeah because it seems like from i guess you know from a pastoral perspective i'm like yeah well no duh that was the result right Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. course that was the result um you're no longer living as if you believe therefore you actually don't believe if you don't live like you believe yeah that's what comes to mind when you tell that story i don't know what do you think graham well, you know, not a very good experiment. Experiment means you get on the other side of it and you make a judgment call. But yeah. I guess they made the judgment call, but the, um, you know, it was already pre, pre, pre predisposed to what the outcome would be. Can you move the microphone a little bit farther from you? Yep, can do. All good. I think you're just peaking a little bit. Or turn down the gain, whichever. I'll turn down the gain slightly. Is that better? Yeah, go for it. You, got, okay. you were more excited in this in this moment than you were testing the mic earlier. <laughs> yeah. um, it, well, just I was just saying, you know, that it, as an experiment, a person saying, you know, what were they experimenting? I guess the outcome was fate complete, really. 
Yeah. Mm. Um, I, it reminds me, you know, one of the things when I was reading, and I have read it quite a number of times now, not an easy book to read, that's uh, St. Augustine's Confessions. He's quite um, antagonistic to his early understanding of Scripture. And, and I think in the North Africa, it was sort of, I mean, who knows, but it was it was probably wild and woolly. Mm-hmm. I was going to almost say a little bit like it is today. <laughs> but it's when he meets Ambrose um, and he starts becoming Christian, there's no point in those confessions where he says, oh, now I'm a Christian. What happens is that you know, he's baptized, he reads scripture, he fellowships. There's this whole process going on. Mm-hmm. And what you get, what you get the, the, um, the thought back to you is that Actually, he stepped in and participated mm. in the life and practices of Christ. Yeah. So there's sort of there's no sort of you know like we we as evangelicals and Pentecostals want to make a big moment of that moment. I'm a Christian now. I'm not. Mm. Um, and and I get the part where we might experience God and such, but actually becoming Christian is a becoming rather than a point. A point. Mm. I wonder. So. Mm. But it raises lots of questions about what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. I'd ask you to turn your game down maybe like a, a quite a bit more, um, and you should be good to go. But you, you, okay, so a bit of, yep. Yeah, that's better. Um, oh, you're, I didn't think of uh, that with Augustine, and you're right. We do focus more on the conversion moment of like, oh, that decisive decision as opposed to actually the living out of the belief. Yeah. And how does that contribute to belief itself? Yeah. So what were your questions, Jonathan? around that you wanted to present uh, you to know us? that i've forgotten them already i know <laughs> I was, i'm sure you did. I'm already into the conversation i don't know I don't no know. um what were they are there practices and habits that lead us that are that are classically lead us more towards cr- becoming christian or mm. being being a follower of jesus are there habits and practices that that definitely lead us away from those or is everything redeemable are all those practices able to be redeemed and lead us towards Christ if we're seeing them, viewing them through the right lens. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's practices that lead us to belief. Um, mm. what, would because, they, what would they be? What would some of those be? Well, I think the biggest one is community, to be honest, right. is, is Christian community. Because I, I have a friend um, or had a friend who, um, who was going through a faith crisis. I remember telling them that the worst thing you can do is to assume that there's such a thing as neutral space. Yeah. Um, and within this maybe faith crisis or deconstruction that you're perceiving, um, the worst thing you could do is actually stop attending church, and the worst thing you could do is actually stop reading your Bible and stop praying. As much as that seems like you're, you've picked a side already and that there's a default side or, or a neutral side that you should pick while you intellectually work this out, mm-hmm. I'm like, I just said there's no such thing as a neutral space. Um, every action presupposes a belief of some sort. Um, right. You know what so I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. So so is the practices that we take up each day, do they are they the outworking of our beliefs? This is I guess this is mm. what I'm trying to get at. Are the practices that we do are they the outworkings of things that we believe? Or do they the or is it the other way around that we may not have that belief yet, but they shape us into a certain kind of framework that allows us to have that belief? Mm. Yeah, I think I get it, getting where so you're going. Which one, which one, and I think this is what Pascal's getting at. What comes first? The practices that we do every day or the belief? And therefore, the practices that we therefore want to be involved in. Which, which one's first? Or maybe that's a false dichotomy. Maybe they go hand in hand. Well, here's, here's to take it away from anything religious. Yeah. So I've got two, and you, and you both have little have had little ones or Joey's mm-hmm. right in the midst of it but so I'm a grandparent and they've been around us they're not here anymore it's wonderful but you know because I've got more space now but it's lovely having them around yeah so the uh, the six month old is fed regularly but it's not lunch morning and tea I, I how, why do we do that three times a day because I, I wonder whether it's it's we it, we're kind of made into it or we're we you know we we're making our day by eating food. Right. And so so, so as a routine, that, that happens for breakfast and then may happen at 12 and then may happen in the afternoon. I mean, we don't, we don't even think about whether we, it's, we believe that food's good for us. 
when we believe we should eat. But I, I think it's more intuitive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess what I was thinking here is that, that it's, did I have to believe that I needed to eat to eat? Right. Or did I just eat because others around me were eating? Mm-hmm. And and I've been and that this way I've been making I have the way in which so a parent uh, feeds the child is already making the child, isn't it? There's right. always a there's a making going on there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, so, here, here's an, here's another one. Sorry, this is to bring us back to 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 throw in another kind of Christian and Christian kind of understanding of this is that think about the church on Sunday morning. And the practices that we set up on a Sunday morning, are we forming people to become consumers of the religious moment? Or are we, cons- are we forming people with the practices that we set up on Sunday morning to become participants in the religious moment? So one, so thinking about what you kind of look at, Graham, so often a lot of the practice on Sunday morning is about coming and watching a screen or watching somebody do something. There's other practices such around communion where it's not just about watching, it's about setting up a practice that brings us into participation with what God is doing. Mm. That's, what, that's what I wonder. So my, my question here is that as believers, what kind of practices are we involved in that take us away from Christ and what kind of practices are we involved in that may set up a barrier for us to following Christ? Because I think they're more, they're they're less seen that we than we actually mm. truly know. So I'm trying to get to what are the what are the practices that we're involved in that are that we're not so that are not uh, what's the right word? Um, you know that we just don't actually know that we're involved in them that may be taking us away from Christ. Yeah, because you're asking that question from last week, which is like, are we we're secular, whether we know it or not, because there's practices that we participate in that actually form us as secular people, even though we might ascribe to a Christian belief system. That's right. Right, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So where are we? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this it, is a it's, good... it's a tough one to get to. It's a tough one to get oh, to. But, this stuff, but I thought this, maybe this we'll stuff, get to it. Maybe we'll this, be able to get to it. This stuff sort of comes around more like PhD stuff, as you would know. Right. Because, oh, yeah. because um, the making in a Sunday morning service has to do with a lot of digital technology. Yeah. And we're not seeing what, what we're doing with that. We're not seeing the way in which we're making ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um we're not seeing the uh, the effects or the causes of that. So, so, so I think, and it's hard to get at, but actually, the making is becoming highly performative. That's right, and I think this this comes back to that it's actually belief. It's actually practice before belief. Mm. So what I what I mean is that we've just taken the Sunday service as an example. Not no one's church here, just a Sunday service that I think a Pentecostal one, maybe that we've all been involved mm. in, often. We sh- we're shaping people to be consumers of the Sunday morning, consumers of the Sunday morning. We turn up to watch and to listen. Now, that once we practice that weekly, in and out, yearly, over and over again, our belief becomes that's the way that we should be interacting with God. Mm-hmm. That becomes the belief because it's formed through the ritual through the practice. I think that's what P- Pascal is getting at. Yeah. That practice comes before belief. And so, if, we, if we shape people in the right way, they will come to believe that that is the way that you come to know God. Mm. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, obviously it raises questions about, which I think is a very legitimate questions for us to ask is so the sunday morning how are we forming people yeah what how, well, how, what how practices are we involved in yeah and and that, that may shape be, our belief and that may even be scrutinized to this um somebody was telling me the other day uh and i was a little surprised that they were using a on the powerpoint the clock mm-hmm. countdown for the service to start okay okay that's a practice what, 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 shall, so yeah, what are okay. we saying 
What you are we like saying? It. Why you didn't you like some it? Feathers. Oh, oh I'm going. Like so, but what are we saying? That's the point. What was it saying? What's that well, saying to you? Well, it says to me somehow that 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 the service starts here and it ends here. You know, I'm just right. I'm just not sure. Right. I think we. To me, I'm going. I'm just not sure that that's what, uh, the question. I don't think has been asked is what pedagogical significance does that practice have, and nobody's yeah. asked the question. It's true because it's something that you do. Nobody's thought about it theologically. Because the pragmatic response would be, "Hey, we just need people well, to get in their point. seats at a certain that's, time." That's, that's right. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, and you're going yeah. well. So what? What are we actually communicating theologically about time? That's a classic example, exactly because. The practice shapes the belief that the service starts at this time. But the so what are we the saying practice, about God? The practice comes first. Yeah. And what That's are we so saying? Interesting. And what yeah. are we saying about God? And what's it say about God? Yeah. The, the that ministry, God turns up at this moment and not, the ministry and not now. one second beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, now, yeah. people say, oh, you're, just, you're nitpicking. But no, but my point is we're not thinking theologically about the practices that we are, we are actually all the little things that we're doing to make ourselves and make this moment. Yeah, that, I think that's it. Yeah, and and you could say what practices aren't there is, um, you know, I think, again, I don't want to be critical of my own church, but I think you say in an Anglican church, I think, is, but where are the practices where we greet one another? Right. You know, genuinely yeah. greet one another. What, what does that practice look like? Mm-hmm. Or is that practice pushed out because the time doesn't allow us to do that because right. that's considered not important? So mm-hmm. I think that we're not really thinking about the practices that actually are part of our worship. And then what are we are we asking? Are they participative practices yep. or are they practices of performance? I think that's a really interesting question. Well, Graham, you have a right to be uh, a bit it's more good. vocal in your, your critique because uh, you're older, but also, you know, you got you're sick now, so it means you can say what you want, right? It gives you a license to say what you want. Yeah, yeah. So you you don't need to pull any punches. Yeah, well, I mean, I I I I really do think that we we don't think about the service. We've so driven pragmatically. We're not thinking about how we're actually forming people. And, and you say, well, Sunday service isn't it? No, but the collective communal practices that we're doing, they're significant. Right. So how often are we practicing communion? Yeah, that's a big one. And how are we doing it? Yeah. Because if you want to get into the participatory aspect of it all and participation in Sunday morning, and I know we're this, we really should be talking about you know belief and action, but if we're talking about participation and what that communicates, you ought, if, the, if there's nothing else in the service, there ought to be that because everybody can participate in that, yeah. you know? Um, I mean, yeah. to use a, an educational term, this is the hidden curriculum, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's the, yeah, it's the cul curriculum or implicit cu- curriculum. It's yeah. the um, yeah, and and that I think if we think about that, gives us the provides us to think about the essence and the form, right? The the yeah, ecology, well, exactly. The ecology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you could do practices, a whole lot of right practices, but be then it could be just <laughs> emptied. Right, yes. Or, or does, or can the practice, even if it's empty, carry a tr- carry a greater truth? Well, yes, if, I think if it can. Practice comes before belief. I don't know. That's just another. That's another side question, maybe. Yeah, because I think what we're having a conversation now is people in house, like those who claim to have a yeah. belief in. Mm-hmm in you know christ and and belief yep. system within christianity but what does that actually mean for someone who isn't a christian mm-hmm. does it does it mean that is there some level of action within society that actually leans someone towards having a belief system that reflects that of christ um or is or is belief in christ purely like creation out of nothing you know like a moment of the spirit kind of renewing the heart Right. And, and then, you know, action then reinforces belief. Or, like, yeah, how does yeah. that work within, you know, uh, a conversion kind of moment? Yeah, exactly. I'm not entirely sure, you know, because obviously we live within a, even though it's secular, still Christian, I would say in a in the large, like, morality scheme of things, to be honest. Things are changing, obviously, but they haven't changed that far mm-hmm. from at least saying, oh, 
so much about our society is actually very Christian, even though they're, it's not Christian in name anymore. Yeah. Um, but when you go to maybe countries or, or nations or people groups that there is no, it is, it is very clearly this is not a Christian, you know, people or group. Yeah. And you yeah. try and present the gospel, it's like it's hard soil. Like it's, it's difficult to even see one person come to, know, come to faith in like a decade. Mm-hmm. Um, why is that? Yeah. Is that because mm-hmm. the actions and, and the and the belief system that is reinforced through action doesn't actually allow for that to happen easily, for the belief to even come out easily? Yeah. Um, because you believe that God's Spirit is working um, even in places like that, but what does it look like for God's Spirit to, for that to be the case? And then I think of like contexts like, say, America, where a lot of the population is at least culturally Christian. And some would say like nominally Christian. Mm -hmm. So for them to quote unquote, come back to Jesus or come to Christ, um, it's an easier step because they're already doing a lot of the, the action belief steps. If you, if you don't understand what I mean, right? Yeah, Yeah, I do. Yeah. So, yeah. So (laughs) there's a lot of things going on and, that's where I'm like, well, it's hard to compare, say, New Zealand to the U.S. or to Canada or the U.K. or, you know, Western Europe. It's so hard to compare all these places and to, like, assume so much about, you know, models or ways of doing ministry or ways of, you know, helping people come to belief. Yeah. It's all so different uh, because it, it's all the starting points are at a very different point within that, like, belief and action spectrum, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is it is this is what you're talking about with practice. It's, it's classic um, James K. Smith, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yep. thinking because yeah, I mean, I mean, his thesis in his uh, desiring the kingdom is basically there are there are um, secular liturgies. That's right, and and I, yeah. and and he talks about uh, th- I think thin and thick. I think that's mm. another helpful c- yeah. category. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, what yeah. are thin ones and thick ones? Um, thin is it thin places and thick places is it yeah like, yeah. yeah I just can't I remember th- th- what, what thin it? and thick descriptions I think yeah I think descriptions. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah 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 descriptions yeah, yeah. What, can yeah. we flesh out a bit more what do you mean descriptions mm, it's been a while since I've thought about yeah. that well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, like likewise with me I mean bright brushing your teeth is kind of uh, a thin one and you'd have a thicker one where it might be something that you I think what we're um, doing now is 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 closer to a thick description so yeah. you know all these all these practices have histories they have uh they're, they're complex um you know they're not then they um there's a lot of different practices that go into probably one practice we drive a car to church yeah. we yeah. take people or we don't yeah. take people mm. these are giving these are fleshing out the kind mm. of the topic that we want to talk about that's a thick description not thinning it down to saying it's either or. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that, you're absolutely right yeah, because that's there, a thick description. There's so many layered on, things layered on each yeah, other. Yeah, um, and it takes I mean, a whole lunchtime on the way to figure these out. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't so work. Two lunches. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I realize. So, 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 I mean, are there are there practices in that that as Christians that we should be involved in? Oh. 100%. Even mm-hmm. through 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 the hard times and through the bad times, are there things that we should just keep on doing, even if we, our belief, even if our belief runs into uh, periods of doubt? Are there things that we should keep doing? Because if we don't, coming back to your story, Joey, are there are there practices that will definitely lead us away from from Christ? A hun- like a hundred percent. Like this one. I go to this one really because sometimes you got to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, I think I think giving is actually mm. is actually oh, a wow. big yep. practice. Yep, yep. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When yeah you I, that, I agree. I think that's wow. actually one of the sneaky thick ones. You know. Really. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Because can you thick thicken that one out? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just like because it's a level of commitment and like faithfulness and and say oh and it transcends. Oh, I'm not really feeling it this week, or oh, I feel that, like. So, for example, if you show up on a Sunday morning or you're part of a community and you're saying, I'm not really getting a lot out of, you know, gathering together and, you know, the ministries of the church in like the recent in recent times, maybe I should stop giving, you know, Mm, well, then you're you're being formed into into a consumeristic product driven um, receiving 
after, you know, uh, after giving, you know, it's like a transaction at the supermarket, essentially, is what you're doing with your Christian formation. Wow. But also, on the flip side, even when you have moments of doubt, it's like, well, I'm not sure if I'm really sold out to this thing. Um, but, you know, I still give my 10%. And it's like, well, I'd say it's still important to do that or to give. I'm not saying what percentage is, impo- is relevant. Um, but it's still important to give because it's still saying, I, I still trust enough in this to wow. like to, to put money where the, my mouth is. And I'd say even in hard economic times, which, you know, many people are going through right now, you might say, oh, the, like the secular reasonable thing to do in this moment would be to uh, maybe just like stop giving for a little bit uh, until things get better. And I say, no, 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 no. Because that's a lack of faith and a lack of trust in, in God's provision for you. And, wow. and everything that you have is not yours anyway. You're simply just stewarding it. So who are you to say that out of what God's giving you, you shouldn't give anything onward to maybe something else? Um, wow. And yeah. I know we have bad images of, you know, giving money to churches because of a lot of, you know, caricatures of, of that in the past. But at a basic level, what you're doing is you're essentially just supporting the community of faith and you're supporting the mission of the church in your local context. Mm. And, and it's beyond consumerism. It's, it's deeply forming you as a person as to say, I spent time to earn this and to receive yeah. this within the marketplace. Um, and I'm willing to, to give a portion of it away um, because I know really where this came from. And I don't want this to have like a stronghold over my heart in my life because I know what that can turn me into. Wow. I think, you know, I, think so I went with money right away, which, you know, I don't think many people would. No, I, that's a great, well said, man. That's awesome. I, I, I would 100% agree with you, you know. And I think part of that is that that, that practice is a, a practice of the kingdom that undoes the alternative which you're saying, oh, well, I didn't get value out of that. I'm not going to give to that anymore. Yeah. That's a very yeah. consumerist, you know, where my ladder's leaning against a consumerist, consumptive worldview. Yeah. Um, as opposed to giving. I mean, yeah, give, I think, you know, hospitality, but that's such another big thing. But but uh, we used to have a lot of people around for our place. We still do, but not like we did. But the practice of having others in your home. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Is is a an important practice, yeah. Um, and I think there are little sub practices around that. I mean, one of the practices that, that that I've I was brought up to, and I've done all my life, is we always say a grace before a meal. Yeah, right. And mm-hmm. you know the the joke was the grace is just about the same thing every time. I don't know. not the point. Yeah, that's not the point. Yeah, it's not the point. Mm. Yeah, we used to mock a father. It used to be a sort of almost one word, as he'd pull all the words together, and and you know, and he'd, he'd be a bit mocked about it. But it, but the point was, it was a practice that you, you're eating food, you're acknowledging, so you're acknowledging the provider. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so well, that's, I just wouldn't have expected that. <laughs> that's awesome, though. It reminds me of um, also on the giving thing, that also giving alms, like giving giving money to people in the street yeah yeah yeah. That are yeah. Poor. yeah because i mean my wife gives money to a woman who sits outside our local supermarket oh, and she's right. always she you know she's always done this but and you know even through you know times you know when we haven't had that much money but what it does is that it's a it's a practice that enforces a belief yeah that that there's other people that are needy more needy than we are mm-hmm. and suddenly the world isn't just about our individualism mm. Mm. it's about a collective that we're all in this together and that if i'm rich and you're poor then i'm going to be poor mm. Mm. <laughs> it, mm. probably in spirit yeah so yeah like, that's yeah. a that's a really good point okay so here's another question is is there are there practices that we are involved in that lead us away from christ and i'm not just talking about the the kind of normal ones maybe that mm. we could think about but I mean, could we put our heads together and think of some of maybe the more hidden ones? So, so to preface, uh, to the, to finish the first question really quick. Obviously, yeah, there, obviously, there's prayer, there's fellowship, there's worship, there's you know, fat, there's all these stereotypically important Bible reading type practices mm-hmm. that we didn't talk right. about because they're they're just self explanatory. Yeah. Um, so just just for the record. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the ones that push you away. Yeah. That's uh yeah. yeah. And on top of that. I think it's worth reflecting on if you are involved in those practices already to reflect on what belief is this supporting. Mm. Mm. I think that's an also that I think because I think they speak to each other. 
So it could be with, you know, hey, I'm involved in this practice. What, what, what is this practice doing for me? Why do I do this? See, this is, it, that's a really intense and I think a bit of a sneaky question. Because cool. I like it, sneaky questions. It's a sneaky <laughs> question because I think people are thinking, well, obviously, like, you know, maybe like excessive drug use or um, yeah, yeah. hanging out with people who have such an influence on you, they begin to turn your heart away from God, maybe. Yeah. Like people might lean towards that. But what I'm thinking about when you ask that question is what practices as Christians do we do that kind of tame the fire that God's placed within our heart? That's a good way of putting it. Mm. That's right. It, that's the question that I'm thinking of because yeah, that's what I would, I'm thinking of too. I would think that there's a lot of people who who would have would have been identified themselves as Christian for like decades, but there's yeah. been no really serious growth within them over those decades. And why is that? Oh man, that's such a good way to put it. You know, because mm-hmm. and people like I've I've interacted with people who are you know in their older years and they lament about that when i bring up certain topics in in church where it's like well i've never heard that before or heard that phrase like that i didn't even know um that that's a thing you know because they might just be waiting for heaven you know and that's within their theology Mm. so but if we're talking about practices i think that consumer consumer ideology that has leaked itself into church um through the different generations of the past is one that prevents us from I wouldn't say it makes us unbelieve, but it makes us unbelieve in a sense of like, do you really believe this? Because your actions haven't really uh, yeah. followed through with the real call of the gospel and what Jesus is asking for you to do. Yes. You know, that's yeah. the kind of stuff. I know. I think of consumerism. What are you thinking, Graham? Like, what are some things well, like that? Like that? I, I think it's helpful to have communal practices that we would practice as a church together mm. Yeah, as a kind of category with soft ends on it, and then individual practices that might push us away. Mm. If I went to the communal one, and we went back to the the importance of the practice of giving, I wonder, because we now do it all by banking, mm. there is no bodily practice within the church that I go to of giving. Mm-hmm. There's no bag that's handed around there is something said from the pulpit, and I'm not necessarily criticizing it, but I'm just saying that's one of those sort of soft things that's been roaded away because we've found a more efficient way to do it. Right. The question is, were we being formed into giving because we were regularly, you know, the the people that took up the offering would come, and, 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 and if you were participating in a church, you'd get the chance to hold the bag and pass it along the aisle. Yeah, I mean, we kind of laugh at saying, "Oh, yeah, it's really man, uh, not manky, but isn't that sort of?" But I go, "Well, actually, what have we lost?" Yeah, the efficient mm-hmm. way of doing it means that we just it just doesn't pop up. Well, mm-hmm. or I if don't it pops have, up, you know, yeah. I don't have an automated like our church does this. We still pass a bag around. Um, oh, you do. A lot people. of churches don't. Yeah, well, well, and very li- like maybe less than two hundred dollars is in the bag, right? In a mm. very small percentage of the weekly um, mm-hmm. giving, and then people bring to the front at the altar like uh, food that we donate to the food bank as an offering as well that people drop off on mm. Sunday mornings. Um, but most people do it on you know give online. So mm. what's fascinating though is that obviously many churches are into an automated system where you don't have to think about it anymore. It just gets taken out of your bank account, right? Because everything's automated, so why not? Um, I remember thinking that I don't want it to be automated. I want to actually, I want to actually do it myself every single time I give. And we, my wife and I, we have a, a rather like, str- not strict, but like intense descripting bu- budget. Mm-hmm. So like every dollar is accounted for in within our bank account. And sometimes I, I don't physically make a bank transfer or give or put money in that, you know, metaphorical uh, basket every week. But sometimes it, it piles up to a very large amount. And wow. when I have to do that e-transfer and take that large amount out of my budget app, I'm like, ooh, that yeah, hurts it. a little bit, you know? Because it's like that's that's two months right there of, you yeah. know, of weekly giving accumulated. And then, boom, it's out. Yeah. And and to me, that that feels like I'm putting, you know, we're putting money in the basket. and But it's, you know... And it's a very conscious thing that I still do, as opposed mm. to it being automated. But yeah, so you're, what you're saying, Graham, is 
not that that leads to unbelief, but that we're, we're being robbed in a sense of, of a formational kind of practice that mm. could form us into greater belief, if you will. Mm. Mm. And it may be that we just need to think about it a bit more. The what, what are the, what are the significant pra- communal practices for us as a church community, mm-hmm. mm. and and then how are we doing them, and and what, you know, there, there may be how we once did them doesn't really work that way. But how do we, how do we do that? I've yeah. often thought about sort of, you know, that the importance of of um, communion or Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a pastor now, so it makes me really easy to say this because I don't have to enact it. But I often thought if I was, I would start trying something like asking a group of people whether they're interested in baking a loaf of bread, getting to church early and baking a loaf of bread. So we were ready to eat that yeah. at communion time. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, and you probably and, have a lot and, of people who would see that as like a whole Yeah, exercise. because what I would say is the people that are making it, yeah. the people that are getting it ready, and the people, then we participate in this live moment. Now, to me, all those elements are highly participative, which then brings back the sort of, this is Christ's body broken for you. Yeah. You know, you know um, I mean, it's just trying to think think it through more. Yeah. That, 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 that it's not just, oh, there, that there are sub-practices involved in this to get to this. That yeah. makes this unbelievably a significant moment for us it's an invitation yeah. to think more broadly i mean there's mm. all the practices that we normally do great keep doing them but think more broadly about the, the mm. practices that we do weekly that we might just take for granted how are they forming us how are they shaping our our spiritual life like the clock countdown mm. you know that's a classic example mm. think about all the things you haven't thought about <laughs> and ask people to you know think about the practices that they see we're involved in maybe that we don't see ourselves i think that's a that's a really it's a great practice maybe mm. to to try and do with your congregation or with what anyone do you, what do you think jonathan so we didn't really touch too much on like those explicit practices yeah. that might lead to unbelief because it, it's actually hard yeah. for us to reflect on that to be honest you know what one you of think? the things yeah, yeah, maybe it's my uh, age and stage in life. But one of the things is, yeah, what, and maybe getting to the end of, um, well, hopefully the end of a PhD is careerism. Mm. I think that's a hidden idol mm. in, in, our, in the Western world. And, um, and I think it's a practice that we could, that we need to think about. For, for one thing, where the practice is that we always want to get the next better job, that we always want to get one up on the ladder, the career ladder. And I just wonder if that that it's a pra- it's a ladder that takes us away from God rather than to God. Mm. Mm. Uh, I don't know. That's as far as I've got with that. Well, but, but it's everywhere. I see it all the time. You know. I'm preparing a lecture talking about the life of the Apostle Paul, which is, you know, a big topic. Yeah. And one thing that I'm struck with by his life, yes, he's unmarried. He may have been married before he was a Christian um, because the word he used to describe himself is a single person or it could be used as a widower in the context. So right. he could be, a, he could have been married, but she may have passed away or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he lives like a, a sense of, of not freedom, but freedom and movement, yeah. Where he's not bound by some of the classic idols of the day, yeah. Which is like the family unit, which is not a bad thing. It's a good yeah. thing, but it, it frees him up to to be able to be, you know, to whimsically be called, if you will, by the spirit as the spirit kind of blows. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that he's a model for everyone. If that was the case, then there'd be no more humans because no one would give birth anymore, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, 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 that's um, right. It's not a realistic for everyone model, but it's like, well, what about, what can we learn from, say, Paul's life as to how he lived his life mm-hmm. and the things that he kind of unrestrained himself with that yeah. allowed him to to fully act within the belief structure yeah. of following Jesus as Messiah? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I wonder around yeah. that too is um so Paul never gave up his trade either. Yep. No, no. So yeah. there would have been these practices of refinement. 
mm-hmm. in terms of his craft. Yep. Which also, I would think that that actually fostered that, but that may have been of the social context of the ancient world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, my worry with careerism, if we were going to thicken that that description, yeah. is that um, it's a practice that, you know, what's that practice involve? Often it involves one upmanship. It involves mm. kind of perfection of of your life and ideas. So you've got to you've got to be better than the next person. And that person does isn't allowed to to then rise into whatever their career is. I'm mm. just saying if you, if careerism becomes a becomes the practice that you want to work your way through life in, it um, and that's your only focus, then that practice it does say something about what kind of life you think what what the good life is. Yeah, I was going to say that. And, and, that's a question there, isn't it? What is the good here? Yeah, that's right. What's what is it? Career for career? Yeah. Or is it career for? Yeah. The, the good, and the kingdom, or that's or, right. Yeah. And the and the practice is, you know, what is it to be blessed? What is it to have a good life in God? And I think my my personal thing is that that should be that should be the practice of this time mm. of my life. Mm. But I'm not sure if that's a great blessing. I don't know if that's a practice I want to participate in because no. I don't know if it actually brings me closer to God or not. Well, I Yet remember it's the practice that's most open to me right now. Yeah. Yes. I, yes, so, exactly. Cause you can do, you need to find work, right? Exa- You're done your PhD. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's the expected thing. Exactly. And my question is all practices are open to us, but is it the right practice? But you've got you got a couple that on top of I have a family and a responsibility. Totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. And that's yeah. why that's why Paul, well, within his particular calling and gift set, he said it's better that he doesn't marry. Totally. You know, but he doesn't say that's the rule. Yeah, that's right. Right, because that's he realized right. that there was a level of not <clears throat> limitation. Because I would say that Paul is even limited in in some sense because he's not he's not within like a family like kind of unit relationship. Like there's a yeah. formational aspect that he won't ever experience or have yeah. never, because he's not in that unit. Um, yeah. But he's not called to that, you know? Totally. Um, yeah. So here's another question. Can you take up a practice and redeem it for God? Could I take up a careerism if my heart was in the right place? Oh yeah. And turn it, well, well that's the question. Is that possible? Or are there some practices that are practices that are simply lead us away from God? It reminds me of the story of, that Lyndon Drake gave when I had it from a lecture about work and faith. Right. And he, I think it was, I had an uncle that was a police officer, mm-hmm. an undercover police officer. Right. I can't. The story was it was a sad story. Yeah. Um, but it raised the question, which I found very, very difficult to. I was deeply conflicted because somebody has to do that. That's such a good point. And you're going, you know, so I think he, again, I, excuse me, Lyndon, if I got this right, if you're listening to it, but um, I, I, I think the guy died with faith, but probably not the faith that we would, you know, faith that we would sort of typically think, oh, that was really Christian. Wow, but it's, it's, it's very challenging. What about the guy? I mean, I've read some stories recently of, um, say, the story of this Ukrainian soldier. And basically, he's the last man standing. The others are dead. And the Russian soldiers are coming. Going, and he, so he really gives his own life. But he takes a whole lot of lives of others. Now, well, I mean, he's dead. He can't really say anything, can he? But, I mean, who does that, though? Going yeah. to war sometimes is not a choice. I don't want to. I don't know. So it, it, I'm only making this more complex for you, Jonathan. <laughs> so it, which would no, then, it's great. Then it would push, this is the thickening. This is yeah. the thickening. Then it yeah. would push this idea that whatever I am doing, I have to have a consciousness of, of you know, that somehow God is in the midst of this. And somehow this is redeemable. Right. That's a tough question. 
That's Whoa, tough. it's a tough question, <laughs> man. It is I'll, difficult. I think some things are easier to redeem than others by how you conduct yourself. Because, like, if I think of the example of Christ as Messiah, the the if you would if you will the worldly career path for him would have been to be crowned king after he fed the five thousand people in the Gospel of John, mm. and the people wanted him to become king in that moment. Right, mm. and mm-hmm. with all of that, you know, if we think of that as a career aspirational moment, he obviously knew he was going to he was he's king. He obviously knew it. Yeah. But how did he redeem it? By not taking it on. He redeemed it by rejecting it and dying on a cross. Wow. Well, he, yeah, he he rejected the form. He rejected, <laughs> yeah. but but isn't it? Yeah, he rejected the form that we thought. Well, exactly. That, he, re- he rejected. He didn't. He, rejected he didn't not form. take up kingship. He just no, rejected exactly. the form. He rejected so, the form. Oh, that's a good point. Too. Yes. So then within, say, careerism and, and climbing the corporate ladder, or if that's the expectation that everyone else wants to assume onto you, then what's, you know, what's the Christian perspective on that? Is it to reject all promotion? Probably not. But under what circumstances would you reject, you know, certain elevations in status as a career? Or when you're in war, what does it look like to be a godly soldier like what is like you know yeah. like that gets tough and how could you take the promotion and 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 show it in a different light yeah mm. like how could you take the mm. promotion and be a different kind of leader because mm. the big the way people yeah. explain it is like christians don't necessarily like diminish like remove their power that they might have within society they use that power to lift others up right right so is it a little bit of that right is it well right. if i am promoted to the say you know, CEO of this organization because people see me as this and five other people didn't get the job because they saw me as the right candidate and therefore I make more money and they make less money um, and I can service my mortgage to a better extent than they can. Yeah, yeah. Um, then what would be the redemption within that? Would it be like maybe I can be a positive change to bring everybody else up within the company as a result? Wow, that's awesome. You know? Yeah. Not to say that you're guilty because you are competent. That's not what I'm saying, but it's to say that with that level of competence and level of persuade, not persuasion, level of influence and power, how can you be a positive uh, influence to the whole or a positive, um, a po- yeah, positive in general for everybody as oh, opposed yeah. to seeing you set up against everybody else? I, I was just thinking, great, man, that's great. I was just Good thinking reflection. of... Um, you know, careerism. So, um, Lewinsky, uh, Lewinsky, the leader of Ukraine. Right. Uh, what was his name? Uh, oh, I forget his name. Anyway, I've got his name. Yeah. Vladimir. Um, there we go. Vladimir, <laughs> Vladimir Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there we go. I mean, it's quite, no, but... it's quite wide, widely reported that the Americans said to him, "We'll get you out of here," mm, and right. he says, "No, I'm not going to. Li- I'm not going to leave." knowing wow. his own life was likely to be taken at yeah. some point. Mm. I mean, and the world, and, the, and we all stand back and go, oh, that is unbelievable. Yeah. So I, 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 I guess what I'm saying there, in the midst of, I mean, he probably, two years earlier, I don't know when he became the um, leader of the, of, the, mm. of the government, but the, a degree of careerism sitting in that. You could be the president. He did a, a comedy show about being the president, and now yeah. he's the president, and Barry takes him as a joke. Mm. But, but yeah, and he probably thought, wow, you know, I'll be president. But, but there's a form that he's taken that has, that has changed the world in the sense that he, did, he didn't leave. He, he took another path. And, yeah. I, and I wonder whether that's part that's of it great. too. I wonder that it's, that, that it's the form that we're, you know, how, how does the gospel play through that, whatever that is? Mm. And, that, and that's not easy questions when you get to um, undercover undercover police and and some of the more darker um, yeah. professions that we have. I, I go, uh, um, you know, h- how do I be a good CEO? Mm. Yeah. Wow, yeah. man. Both your answers... <laughs> I've blown my mind. It's awesome. I think we. I think Thanks. we're gonna end it there. I think we're getting yeah. past That's our. That's so past good, guys. That's so good. Yeah. yeah. Great conversation. Yeah. yeah. No thanks, everyone. <laughs>